An old preacher was out fishing one day. See, I just about to lead into that. An old, fit, an old pre preacher was out fishing one day when he looked down and saw a frog sitting next to him. The frog said, Sir, I've got a spell cast, cast on me. If you'll kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess and I'll make you happy for the rest of your life. The old preacher smiled and put the frog in his pocket. A moment later, he looked into his pocket to see how the frog was doing. The frog said, Sir, I'll, if you will kiss me, I'll turn into a princess. The old preacher smiled and was about to put the frog back in his pocket. The frog shouted, Wait! I'm a beautiful princess. I can make you happy. With a grin, the old preacher said, Honey, at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. I'm going to read in the New International Version on this. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 to 6. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like the living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Yeah. The Scripture refers to Christ as the living stone. And then refers to us as living stones. Specifically, it says, you also like living stones. Before we get into this part of the message, I just want to give you some scripture that refers to stones in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Jacob used a stone as a pillow the night that he wrestled with God. Joshua set up memorial stones as a reminder for future generations of God's power. David chose five small stones, smooth stones, to fight the lion and only used one to kill him. Elijah took 12 stones to build an altar to God, but he called down fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. There's a time to cast stones and a time to gather stones. Jesus told the Pharisees to let the one without sin cast the first stone. Jesus declared if we keep silent, the stones will cry out, cry out and praise to God. Thank you. Now, the author of this passage that we're looking at this morning is Peter. And we know Peter is one that's spontaneous. One that had a temper, one who denied Christ, and one who was embarrassed because he denied Christ. Another thing about Peter that we may not see very often is we know Peter studied the Word of God. You say, well, we didn't have the New Testament at that time. No, but we did have the Scriptures written down. We also know that Peter loved God. And we know all of these things because in writing this passage, he refers to Psalm 118, verse 22, that says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Also in Isaiah 28, 16, it says, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure, a sure foundation. Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone of the church. How long does it take to build a church? With that question comes another. 
That being, how do you define a church? And you could go on with that discussion for quite some time. But in our language, the definition of church refers to a building. However, when you look at it from the eyes of God, when you look at it from the way that God looks at it, it has nothing to do with the building. It has nothing to do with a piece of property. But it has everything to do with the believers coming together. And this concept might be hard for some and easy for others to understand, but the church is the people. We could have an earthquake and this building may fall flat, but we would still have church and there would still be a church Amen. left standing. Peter refers to Jesus as a living stone. Have you ever seen a living stone? Anyone? Have you ever seen a living stone? I saw some heads nodding. But... Do you know what a living stone is? Maybe I should ask you if anyone has ever seen a stone move on its own. Okay, of course not. But if you did, it would sure cause commotion, wouldn't it? Somebody would be out investigating to find out what really was going on with that. As I said, Peter referred to Jesus as a living stone. And then he said, you also are living stones. Have you ever pictured yourself as a stone? I, I know sometimes you have to picture somebody else, you know, like, you know, you've heard that saying, hard-headed. Well, that's close. <laughs> Not only is Jesus a living stone, it says he is the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone in a building is the most important part of that building. It must be perfectly fit. So it gets chiseled. So it can be used to make all the other walls square. The cornerstone also would carry most of the weights of that building. When you are building a building out of stone, each stone has got to be perfectly shaped to make it fit perfectly. In fact, I'm told when, it, when it's a stone wall is done, you should not be able to even put a piece of paper in between any of those stones. As the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ is the perfect one. As the cornerstone, he is the foundation of everything that you and I believe in. He is strong. And we know that because he has carried the weights of the world on his shoulders. And the weight of the building of the church rests on this stone. Many of us feel that we carry a lot of weights on our shoulders. People expect a lot out of us. We have a lot of trials, we have temptations, we have difficult situations in our lives. Yet Jesus says, bring every one of them to him and lay them at the feet there at the chief cornerstone. Jesus as the foundation is where we start. And it's where it all begins. Without Jesus, there is no church. One version says, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. In other words, there's a choice to be made. There's a choice I need to make. There's a choice you need to make. First, am I willing to build myself on Christ as the Lord? Second, will I allow God to work on my rough edges? To be built into God's spiritual house. And now, you're going, 
Great, now it's starting to get a little tough here. Because you're asking me to put myself in the position to allow God to start chiseling away on me. Because stones need to be chiseled. You are a part of the building blocks of the church of Jesus Christ. Stones need to be formed, fitted, so that we can be placed where the master builder wants us to be. Without taking the rough edges off, it makes it difficult to be placed where we need to be placed. If we can make the scripture, or if we could remember the scripture that says, trials come to make us strong, now, I know that's not exactly how the word states it, but that is exactly what it implies. It's found in James chapter 1. Oftentimes, your trials, the situations that you face in everyday life, it's God working on you. It's God shaping you. You know the time that you're put into a position where you just want to just break loose and scream and yell at somebody? <laughs> how you react and how you respond to that situation is God shaping you. And if you come out of that trial in the wrong way, you're going to be put through it at the end. I'm just forewarning you. You're going to go through it again. I had a friend of me, a friend of mine, say, Craig. I wish God had quit working on me because I just keep going around the mountain and I go around the mountain and I go around the mountain. I have to go through that trial forever. I said, well, learn it. Learn what God is trying to shape you into. He's not doing it just to make you hurt. He's doing it because he wants to shape you. So he has a church that's ready for him. Even after we have asked Jesus to come into our hearts. Doesn't mean that we're perfect all of a sudden. We still have rough edges. Some of those... Anyone have rough edges here? Lots. Okay. I thought I was off on the left field. Some of those rough edges are this. Our mouth. <laughs> you didn't have to laugh. It's not like you're guilty. Our attitudes. Anger. Pride. Let me just let me just wrap it all up like this. Anything that doesn't reflect Christ in your life, God's gonna want to chisel it away. Yeah. Anything that's not pleasing to Him, God's going to want to chisel that away. Your trials, that's God working on you. Working on those rough edges. He wants us to be a reflection of Him. He wants the world to see Him in you. He wants us to take all of those rough edges in our life and surrender every one of them to Him. And in surrendering that to Him, allowing Him to chip away, shape you into that image that reflects Him. A person that reflects Christ Yes, the chiseling hurts, but it must be done. We can't correct all of those areas in our life on our own, but we can and must allow God to do it. 1 Peter 1, verse 16 says, Be holy, for I am holy. Why? Because we are citizens of God's kingdom. And we should want to reflect the cornerstone in our life. The cornerstone being Jesus Christ. 
So Jesus is a living stone. 1 Peter 2.5 again says you are living stones. Meaning if you have asked him to come in and live within you, then you are a living stone. I can picture some of you walking out of this place this morning looking at somebody next to you and saying, hey, did you know I'm a stone? I'm a living stone. Jesus is building his church and you are part of that living, breathing church, meaning that you are a living stone because you're a part of that church. You are not alone, no. There are no two stones that are alike. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. I want to read that this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, <coughs> rose into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God Amen. in the Spirit. We as believers are members of the household of God, in whom the whole building is being fitted together. So if you're having problems with another brother or sister in the Lord, what should you do? I gave you the answer three weeks ago. <laughs> Get over it. Real simple answer. If you're having problems with somebody in your life, another brother or sister in the Lord, get over it. Because if you don't, what's God going to be doing to you? He's going to be taking that chisel, working on you. Chiseling away at that attitude. Chiseling away at that negativity in your life. But God, I don't want to. They rub me the wrong way. I don't like them. God says, I'm going to put you right next to that person. So both of your rough edges are dealt with. Now, you're not going to find that in the Bible, okay? But the principle of it you're going to find it. Why? Because you are living stones and he's going to place you where you need to be. I believe that God is using the church in a great way. I hear some people moan and groan about what the church is doing, saying, oh, it's horrible, it's going down, it's just not doing any good. But friends, their eyes are closed. God is using the church in a great way. And it takes people like you and I working together, worshiping together, fellowshipping together, praying together, drawing closer together so that we can go forward as a mighty army. Together, we can accomplish so much more than we can by ourselves. Also here in 1 Peter 2, it says, you are a royal priesthood. You're royal. You have royal blood flowing through your veins. Be excited about that. Now, in Bible days, priests were men set aside by God to serve God on behalf of the people of God. The priests did the work of ministry. The priests did the work of worship. They served God in the holy places on behalf of the people of God. The priests made the sacrifices. But then Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. And as a result of that, we have all become priests 
we no longer need someone else to do the work of ministry for us. We don't need the priest to do it. We don't need the pastor to do it. Thank you, Curtis. Can I walk off now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we are workers together. Amen. We are workers together. We don't need a professional to do it. We're all able to do God's work. That's right. God has given us the talents. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. you can look around at the people around you, and you may not see some of the talents that they have, but they're full of talents, things that God has put in your hearts, that has put in your lives that you could better serve Him. Amen. Amen. Some of you might need them woke up a little bit. Some of you might need them stirred up a little bit. But God has given each one of you abilities and talents to be able to serve Him. Amen. And we need to use what God has given us. Amen. In this spiritual house, God is building. He has given each of us talents to use for Him. Amen. And again in 1 Peter 2, you are a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of Him. The Message Bible says it this way, you are God's instruments to do His work and speak out for Him, to tell others of the nights and day difference that He made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Does that reflect some of your lives this morning? Does that reflect all of our lives this morning? Mm -hmm. God's, we are God's instruments to do His work. To show the night and day difference that He has made in our lives. I have so many people come to me and they feel like they're nothing in their life. Mm -hmm. They are frustrated with life. They are discouraged with life. They want to give up on life. I want to encourage you this morning, as you think of what the Word of God says, again, He has changed us from nothing to something and from being rejected to being accepted. You are accepted in God's kingdom. You are somebody in God's kingdom. You are worth that your value is unlimited in the kingdom of God. That's right. As you begin to do what God wants you to do. Begin to praise Him. Because you are somebody in Christ. You are a part of the body of Christ. Amen. The thing that we need to do, and I have shared, with this, shared this with you many times, if I am ever down and discouraged, or if I just am feeling weary, I just begin praising Him. Just begin praising Him. You come to a point in your life where you feel like it's not worth it, and you feel like you're not worth it, begin praising Him. Begin praising Him. Psalm 118, verse 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Declare it. Proclaim it. And determined to do it. Thank you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice mm -hmm. and be glad in it. It's a choice. Amen. It's your choice. How are you going to live it? How are you going to do it? One of the easiest verses in the Bible to remember. Psalm 118, 24, because it's a verse <coughs> that we sing. Mm -hmm. This is the day that the Lord hath made. 
we will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've been able to spend in your word. Father, I just want to encourage again as people to rejoice in you. We are all members of the body of Christ. The church triumphant, not defeated, but it is triumphant. Yes. We as a church will continue to go forward in you. A mighty army. Not backing down, not retreating, but taking new territory. God, I thank you for the strength that you did each one of us. Father, this morning I just pray if there be anyone here this morning that seems weak, discouraged, or down, God, that they be encouraged in you. They can look to you for their strength. And I thank you for that, Lord.